Both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump sit down with Matt Lauer this week, and the NFL is back. Our interview with Michael Bidwell, the president of the Cardinals. Welcome to the Mike Broomhead Show. Well, I got a message. I got a song. Can I get a witness? Tell me what's going on. Show the people. Very excited. We go out to the Cardinals training facility and we talk with Michael Bidwell, the president of the Arizona Cardinals, about all things Cardinals and what is anticipated to be a great season right here in the Valley. But we wrap up all of the big news stories of the week with something we call the sweep. All right, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump sat down separately with Matt Lauer, and they did what was a commander-in-chief forum. It had a lot to do with national security. Hillary answered a lot of questions about uh, emails, which we'll get to in a few moments. But Donald Trump, in his portion of sitting down with Matt Lauer, was asked about leadership and about what, he was, what qualified him to be commander-in-chief. He talked about leadership under Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton linking them together, and he said some pretty strong words about the current generals who are in charge of our military. Watch this. Well, the generals under Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton have not been successful. Do you know ISIS, more about ISIS than they do? I think under the leadership of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, the generals have been reduced to rubble. They have been reduced to a point where it's embarrassing for our country. Pretty strong words about leadership right now in our military and at the top in the White House. But the most controversial comments that Donald Trump made was when he talked about Vladimir Putin being a great leader and better at leadership than Barack Obama. Watch this. The fact that you say you can get along with him. I do think you I'll think be able to day, get along with him. Do you think the day that you become president of the United States, he's going to change his mind on some of these key issues? Possibly. It's possible. I don't know, Matt. It's possible. And it's not going to have any impact. If he says great things about me, I'm going to say great things about him. I've already said he is really very much of a leader. I mean, you can say, oh, isn't that a terrible thing? He called him. I mean, the man has very strong control over a country. Now, it's a very different system, and I don't happen to like the system. But certainly in that system, he's been a leader far more than our president has been a leader. We have a divided country. So Donald Trump says that Vladimir Putin is a better leader than Barack Obama and the world explodes. Now, I've got to tell you, in the context of what you heard him say there, not as controversial as it's being made out to be. But I've got to tell you where I disagree. Vladimir Putin is a murderous dictator. That's what he is. I have absolutely no problem saying that we have no leadership in the White House right now, especially when it comes to foreign policy. Even Obama supporters have to admit his foreign policy has been a failure. We're still in Iraq. We're still in Syria. ISIS is stronger than ever. The world still hates us. You look around, his foreign policy has failed on every front. We are not more respected. We are not more liked anywhere in the world. So his foreign policy has been a failure. But to say that Vladimir Putin is a better leader is going to send a really weird message to the undecided voters because he's a murderous dictator. Now let's switch over to Hillary Clinton and talk about her time sitting down at the Commander-in-Chief Forum. She was asked about her emails. We all know that Comey, James Comey from the FBI, has said Hillary Clinton sent and received top secret emails, at least eight emails that were marked, marked top secret, and 130 emails that were classified. Here is how she categorizes what she did. Classified material has a header which says top secret, secret, confidential, nothing. And I, would, I will repeat this, and this is verified in the report by the Department of Justice, none of the emails sent or received by me had such a header. Well, there you are. Now we've got one more excuse. First, she said she never sent or received classified information. Then she said she never sent or received anything that was marked classified when she sent it. Now she's saying it was a header that has to say classified or top secret. None of that is true. Here's the issue. I'm not voting for Hillary Clinton anyway, and there are many people that none of this is going to change their mind. The problem is she continues to lie about it. Why not come out and say, I did the wrong thing? People would forgive you. There's bigger issues. We've got health care to talk about. How are we going to defeat ISIS? They would forget about the email scandal, except she continues to tell story after story after story. 
One other big news story of the week, it has now come to light that we paid a total of $1.7 billion to the Iranians. We know about the $400 million cash payment the day that our hostages or prisoners, whatever you want to call it, were released. But there was an additional $1.3 billion in cash in two separate payments sent to Iran from the American government. Now, that is interest on the money that we said we owed them. It is making people furious, and it should. This is an illegitimate regime, and we've just given a terrorist regime $1.7 billion. So there's your big news stories of the week. Coming up here in just a few moments, my interview with Michael Bidwill. Michael Bidwill is the president of the Arizona Cardinals. He's got a great interview. Wait till you see it. Don't go away. We are at the Cardinals training facility with President Michael Bidwell. Thanks for doing this again. It's just like last year. So uh, happy to do it. This is exciting. We just got off the practice field a few minutes ago. Um, you know, it's Wednesday of the week of opening uh, uh, of our home opener against the New England Patriots. Uh, we're not quite ready, but we had a great practice today. We'll have another good one tomorrow, another good one Friday, walk through Saturday, and we'll be ready to go. We feel very, very good about how the team's prepared. So how do you feel about now this year, there's kind of a mark on you. Sports Illustrated picks you guys to win right. the Super Bowl, and they say Larry Fitzger Fitzgerald's going to be on the cover. Something you enjoy that kind of attention, or would you rather not have that X on you this early? Well, if you're going to be a good team, you're going you're to have uh, a, a mark on you, a target on you. Knock on wood that we didn't get jinxed by any of these predictions. But uh, coach also has the, in the mindset of the locker room and coaches reminding them constantly that we can't read all that stuff and believe it. We've still got to go out there and win the games. We've still got to take this day by day, week by week. It's part of the process. So today we needed to have a great Wednesday. Tomorrow we have a great Thursday. And that all builds up to a great Sunday. So how much does last year and the attention put on you with the all or nothing, which was a great series to watch. I still haven't watched the final episode. It's tough to watch. I haven't watched it. I, I don't know that I'm going to because I know how it ends. I'm not real happy about it. But watching that entire season and then um, the way it happened with the Packers game and, and everything else, how does that prepare you and how does it help the coaches prepare for this year? Well, actually, I think it goes back to, to show eight of all or nothing, which is on Amazon uh, video. What a series. It was a fantastic series. But show eight, as you mentioned, it, it, it was about the NFC championship game 
and how we lost in Charlotte against the Carolina Panthers. And what that turns out to be is a great motivator for all of us. All of us. I mean, it's just not Carson Palmer and the defense and the offense and special teams. It's all of us are motivated. And that's why we took we did a lot of moves in the offseason to bolster the talent on the team and get us ready for 016. We saw how close we were, but we also saw some of the deficiencies. And so we are motivated at this point. Uh, going into 2016, we embrace the, the high hopes that everybody has because we have the same expectations of ourselves. You know, it's funny because as a fan, it was such a hard pill to swallow. I can't even imagine how tough it was for you, but being that difficult, is that part of what gets you motivated to make sure you don't have that same feeling going into the, the playoffs this year? Abs absolutely. There's only one happy team at the end of an NFL season. And, you know, there were uh, three of us this year that, that, that were in the NFC Championship weekend. Only the Broncos were happy after Super Bowl 50. So our goal is to win Super Bowl 51. There's a lot of process that happens between now and then. That is our goal. We're not going to be satisfied unless we, we get it done. So let's step back because there's been a lot written about you and how the team has progressed under your leadership. And it's pretty remarkable. I mean, you have really got quite a resume going of, of playoff appearances and, and Super Bowl appearances. Um, what has changed um, under your leadership? What's the difference in this team now? Because it looks now like the expectation is always to win. How did that happen? Well, I think number one, you know, the stadium, we, we enter this weekend's game. It'll be our 106th sellout at University of Phoenix Stadium. That has really been uh, the cornerstone for our success, having the revenue to go out and pay the players, manage our cap the way we do, hire the kind of coaches we want. Um, but it's also, you know, it's leadership, it's accountability, and it's performance. And we have set a standard here, and we're going to keep holding it up. Everybody talks about chemistry. Now, I was a high school football coach, and chemistry was always such a big deal, making sure the team was a team. With the coaches you have and with the leadership and management you have, what's the chemistry like on this team? I think it's excellent. You know, in each in the NFL, each season there are different players. There's probably about 25 to 30 percent of our roster that turns over. So it's new players from last year, but many many returning starters, which is good, and it gives us a consistency in our locker room. Uh, but I think most of it it's about everybody has the same high expectations. Everybody we talk about staying in our lanes, doing our jobs, making sure that we're accountable to each other, but also to ourselves. Who are the player leaders? I mean, Larry Fitzgerald's obviously, Teron Matthew, who else? Who else are some of the player leaders? Well, I think, first of all, I would say we are blessed with probably too many for me to, to name without, uh, but just going on offense, you look at Carson, you look at Larry, David Johnson's become a leader. Oh my God. Chris Johnson's a leader. You look at the offensive line, Jared Valdir, Mike Upati. Um, A.Q. Shipley uh, has is, is done a nice job as our center. He's, he's running things as center. Uh, you look at, uh, you know, Michael Floyd's come along. This has got to be a big year for him. Flipping over to the other side, uh, you know, Calais Campbell, uh, Tyron Matthew, Patrick Peterson for sure, you know, um, who else? You know, I, I, I think Chandler Jones, the, the uh, pass rusher we traded for, is coming and done, done a nice job and really set a high standard. So we've got a lot of great players. Frosty Rucker is a, is a reserve lineman that is constantly in the rotation who is doing a heck of a job. He is a great leader as well. We've got some great folks inside that locker room that are both great in the locker room, great on the sideline, great on the field. Are you a superstitious guy? Uh, Are you? Y y yes and no, but uh, you know it's one of those. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to leave superstitions behind and just focus on let's go out there, stick to the process, and make sure we perform well. Because I'm not superstitious, but I've kept my word because I have two Cardinal jerseys. I have a Kurt Warner jersey, right. and I have an Edgar and James jersey. I got the Edgar and jersey, and he was gone. Now my favorite player on the team is Calais Campbell because he's a U guy. I'm not getting a Calais jersey. I'm just not going to do it because I'm afraid if I do that, I'm going to jinx the whole thing and he's going to be gone. Yeah. So I don't want to do that. We need a big year out of Calais this year. I mean, he is such an important part of our defensive line, that rotation. And if we can get the kind of play, you look at Robert Kandichi, who's going to be playing in that rotation. Those two guys can be extremely disruptive to offensive lines and give our pass rushers a chance to rush the passer and our, our corners and our safeties a chance to pick off some, uh, some passes. All right, I want to take a quick break, but I want to not lose the significance of the fact that you're opening the season on September 11th and this stadium being built right after 9-11 or the first one built after 9-11. So get your reflections on 9-11 and talk about this season moving forward. We'll be back in just a moment with Michael Bidwell.
We're back. We're here at the Cardinals training facility with team president Michael Bidwill. And let's shift to the start of the season. Starting on September 11th, you and I talked last year, and you really, um, I was so impressed with your reflections of 9-11 from a personal standpoint, but also, you know, Pat Tillman and the things that have happened since. What is this going to mean to you? Well, I think it's, it's significant. First of all, I can't believe 15 years has passed by. It seems like it was just a few years ago. Um, I think it's going to be a big deal, and we're playing on Sunday night football, so it's a nationally televised game. Uh, the league is doing a bunch of league-wide um, remembrances. Uh, we're we're going to have a lot of things going on at the stadium on game day, but there's no doubt in my mind I'm going to be thinking about uh, a couple things. I'm going to be thinking about Pat Tillman. I'm going to be thinking about all those men and women that have died in combat, including yeah. your brother. And when I think about uh, all of the the sacrifice that great Americans have made, and and the the a little bit of the scary thing is is ISIS or ISIL is now even more. Uh, 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 of a terrorist organization than what we saw 15 years ago. So we've got to be more vigilant and we've got to come together as a country. I think most Americans and most people in that stadium, other than young people maybe uh, who are too young to understand what was happening, um, this is a big deal day for us. And so we're going to try to make it special, but also try to get a, a victory. One of the things that I've, I've really talked about a lot on, my, on the radio show and even in the TV show is about the Cardinals as an organization under your leadership. Um, and a lot of people don't know this, but um, when we had a Phoenix police officer that was killed recently, you and some other members of the team came out to meet with the family. There was no press release. There was, it was really just more to show a sign of support. And I also know that the Cardinals organization also wrote a check for the family as well. Your um, community involvement and focus is, such, is so impressive to me. What motivates that in you? What is that about you? Yeah, and that Phoenix police officer's name was David Glasser. Yes. He was a member of the Red Sea, part of our fan base, came to every game. Uh, it really struck a chord with us when we realized one of our own had been killed in the, in the line of duty. And so uh, we reached out and we wanted to you know, wrap our arms around the family. Family's actually going to be out on the Great Lawn Sunday before the game oh. with you know, a, a number of uh, the members of his precinct coming out to just have a tailgate as, as he would have if he was still here with us, just having a great time. He was a, a huge Cardinal fan. And, um, uh, and so we're looking forward to honoring him and, and, uh, and, and making sure his friends and family have a good time on Sunday and that they come away with a victory as well. It's so funny because I know the business side of this for you, it is about wins and losses, but watching you, one of the things I loved about the series, the All or Nothing series, was watching your interactions with the fans. And we see this all the time. You go out to the tailgate, right. you, you greet fans coming in. What's that like for you? Um, it's, it's fun, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, there, there's part of me where I didn't, I wish I didn't have to have a suit on and be a work day and I could be out there drinking beer with the fans. But, you know, I like mixing it up and making sure everybody's pumped up and reminding them, hey, we're all in this together. You know, I don't know what the outcome of each game is going to be, but we're sure as hell going to, you know, cheer as hard as we can uh, because our fans have given us an amazing ability. There's no team in the last couple of years that's won more fourth quarter close games than the Arizona Cardinals in, in the NFL at home and it's because of the Red Sea, our fan base, that gets so loud in that fourth quarter, gives our players and coaches the energy to get it done. All right, so let me ask you kind of a controversial question. The only one I'll ask you. The Colin Kaepernick, um, what he's done in the preseason with, with uh, sitting during the national anthem, um, what would your reaction be if one of the Cardinal players wanted to do that or did do that? Well, uh, first of all, I don't believe any Cardinal player will do that. I think they I respect the uniform and I, th I think they respect everybody here and they respect the flag. And if people want to speak individually, they're not going to, I, I don't think they're going to be doing it on our sideline. I agree with you. And that's one of the things that I love about this team is so easy to cheer for from Larry Fitzgerald to the rest of the people on the team. And um, I think you had said to me one time when we had talked that after that all or nothing series, right. people have been reaching out to you saying, hey, I'm a Bears fan, but you're my second favorite team now. Right. Is that still happening? Oh, yeah, it's still happening. And, uh, you know, it, it's amazing that even though we're, we're into the regular season now, you know, week one, um, people are still on social media commenting that they're just watching All or Nothing now. So I hope fans that are watching this go to Amazon Video, and it's an eight one-hour docu-series. The players really didn't understand what was going on, but it's the first time ever uh, throughout an entire season the cameras have come in and been embedded with an NFL team and got to go to meetings that I have with the coach, and it's very open. Yeah, even if you're not a football fan, it's compelling. It's oh, yeah. such drama and so compelling and so much human interest. Um, i got to tell you, I, I'm a fairly unemotional person, but the, the, was it seven when, you, when you're with the dog? I don't yeah, want I think to give it away. Yeah, it was, it was late in the episodes. I think it was five or six. When, that was pretty touching. Yeah. 
Yeah, and we, we didn't know it was happening, and we started this thing, and you know, uh, Riley, my dog, was just fine and healthy and happy and everything else, and all of a sudden she got really sick in the middle of the season, and you know, you know the rest of the story. I do, now. but what a, what, a, what a moment for you to allow the cameras to continue to be a part of that as well. I think that transparency is part of the reason why they love the Cardinals organization so much, because it starts with you doing that. So, looking forward to this season. Super Bowl is the goal. Um, we're looking forward to a great season as always. What do you say to the Cardinal fans out there? What should they expect from you this year? Well, I think they're going to they're going to see explosive offense. I think they're going to see the defense is greatly improved. I can't wait to see our pass rush. I can't wait to see what some of our young players are doing. It's great to see our, our players coming back healthy, especially Tyron and and a few of the others that were injured late last year. Uh, Chris Johnson. Uh, it's great to see. We've got so much talent, and we talk about it all the time. Talent will not be our excuse. Uh, it's about we got to go out and execute. Let's take it week by week. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, but you know, this is a process, and I just say keep cheering, and, uh, and and let's go Cardinals. Well, thanks for letting us do this. And he's right, go Cardinals. Thank you so Mike, much. Thanks Appreciate so much. It. Appreciate it. Thank all you. All right, let's see if we can't pull it off this year. Welcome to one of my favorite parts of the program. We call it From Arizona for America. It's our way to congratulate and thank the fine Arizona men and women who have recently graduated from boot camp and are now serving in our country's military. So join me this week in honoring Airman Jonathan Moberly from North Canyon High School in Phoenix. Airman First Class Nicholas Clark from Gilbert High School in Gilbert. Airman DeAndre Timpson from Raymond S. Kellis High School in Glendale. For a full list of more of our friends and neighbors that are from Arizona for America, go to the Mike Broomhead page at aztv.com. We'll be back in a moment with Broomhead's Best and hashtag this. Don't go away. All right, it's time for this week's edition of Broomhead's Best. Arizona lost an American hero. World War II veteran Navajo code talker Joe Kelwood passed away at 95 years of age. I've gotten to know Mr. Kelwood or had gotten to know him over time. What a great gentleman he was, not only with Native American history, but his service in the United States Marine Corps. At every event I've ever attended with him, he ended his speaking by singing the Marine Corps hymn in Navajo. There's never been a dry eye. What a great time in getting to know that gentleman. He's this week's Broomhead's Best. Now it's time for Hashtag This. 
All right, hashtag never forget. It's unbelievable. 15 years ago on Sunday, we were attacked on September 11th. As Rudy Giuliani said, it was the worst of humanity, meaning the best of humanity, and how America responded. Hard to believe, hashtag never forget, 15 years ago this weekend. We'll be back here in just a moment to close out the show. Don't go away. Hard to believe that it's been 15 years since September 11th and the attacks on New York City, Washington, D.C., and the plane that went down in Pennsylvania. There are kids right now in high school that weren't alive or don't remember, even if they were alive, what happened on 9-11, which means it's more important now than ever that the rest of us make sure they never forget what happened on 9-11. So do something this weekend to remind them of how great the U.S. responded to those terrorist attacks. Next week on the show, Lori Roberts from AZ Central, one of my favorite columnists at AZ Central, joins us this show. And a special thank you to Michael Bidwill for the interview this week. Go Cardinals. We'll be back next week. God bless. Get more of Mike Broomhead on Facebook, Twitter, and, of course, weekday mornings from 6 to 10 on News Talk 550 KFYI.